podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode and following on from the last episode, which was individual versus group therapy, we're going to be looking at couple therapy, which is another form of therapy and not all therapists do couples. Some, some just do individuals. So, yes, some do individuals. Yeah. I mainly did individuals and group therapy and I sometimes work with couples as well. So I did all sorts of different styles, variations, modalities of therapy. And couples therapy was one of them. Interestingly enough, though, <clears throat> in the actual four-year training at our institute, so you could become a clinical, it was individuals. There was no training in our four-year training on couples therapy. And if there was, um, it was asked for specifically, and we might have fed it in, but in terms of the program, it's, you, you know, couples therapy isn't there. So people went off and did extra training in couples therapy. Yeah. To actually then be a couples therapist. I mean, if you listen to the last podcast, I think you asked me, do you have to do sp specific training in group uh, therapy to be a group therapist? And I answered back to you, well, a lot of people uh, in their own therapy have done group therapy and then you've already got a model for it. Yes. Well, in this situation, not that many therapists have models of couple therapy. Um, and it's and there are specific models like a Margot therapy, which uh, is very, very, very exclusively for couples. So you can go and get trained and a friend of mine does that. Uh, and so there's different models for couples therapy that you can go and get trained in, which is what I would suggest, whether it only be a three month training or a year's training. But yeah. I would definitely suggest you do some specialist couples training after you're graduated from your individual training, because I think it's a different art altogether. Yeah. It doesn't mean your individual experience and training won't be of great benefit, but once you move into couples therapy, you could almost see it as a systemic therapy where you're dealing with a system rather than a, just one individual. So couples, so I'm, advocate, I'm an advocate of some aspect of couples training before you actually advertise as a couples therapist. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, because it, it, it is a completely different beast. <laughs> Very, very different, yeah. yeah. And people come for couples therapy usually when communication is broken down between the two of them. Yeah. And before they actually call it a day, their last chance in the saloon usually is couples therapy. And if you think of organisations that you might know well, Relate would be one of them. I think that's now called something else uh, that the public would go to to specifically get um, counselling or therapy um, to do with their relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something that I was quite open with, um, and still am, I suppose, with the couples that I see, that it, it, is, it is communication, you know, that's the key to a lot of it. And having couples therapy doesn't automatically mean that the relationship will suddenly be okay. It might be that they go through a separation and the couples therapy allows them to do that appropriately, let's say. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing I often usually say at the beginning if I see couples. Um, one of my friends is... Uh, uh, runs a psychotherapy center which is predominantly for couples and he's one of the few Margot couples therapists in Manchester and uh, when he talks about couples therapy and I really agree here from working with couples is even more than individual therapy you would give the couples homework to do yeah 
So it's quite a lot of, I say homework, but I'll say exercises at home. Yeah. Between the two of you. Uh, more than an, more than homework through individual therapy. Um, there's a lot of behavioural exercises often given to couples to help them to improve their communication away from the hour that they see the therapist. Yeah, and I can see why that would be beneficial. Mm. Yeah, because then they can they can kind of put it into practice and come back and feedback and see how it went and then you know move on type of thing yeah yeah I was found couple me, therapy. the couples therapy we, we, the, the dynamics of it it's kind of like two's company and three's a crowd and the drama triangle playing out in the therapy room and you know me being seen to be unbiased and you know yeah I think sometimes they want you to be on their side against the other party and it's about being completely neutral a lot of the time and did you find that hard yeah to start off with I did yeah I could see the game playing out in front of me yeah so the boundaries was was really important I thought right from the get-go that this is how it's going to work and you know, unless it's contracted that one of you is going to talk more in the session, then it's important that, you know, you allow each other time to speak in the session. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the more training on that, the better. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it took me a while to get comfortable with it, I think. Yeah. And, and again, following on from from the last episode about, you know, whether we see individuals and then the couples come together or whether it is just every session, both, you know, husband and wife, and that's what it is at end. Yeah. I think you're talking now about different trainings and different models. So. I could think of two particular models, and one of them, uh, and this is to do with couples counselling, one of them would train you down the way you've just talked about, is that you, from the beginning, you would see the couple exclusively, yeah. and they wouldn't speak up at all. Yes. So every time you saw them, you know, the, the work would be with you. <clears throat> and then I can think of another model particularly, where... That, uh, I think of many therapists for this, by the way, where they might say at the beginning, okay, so the, there might be a time where we would contract, you know, to, to see both of you individually uh, for four sessions or three sessions, whatever it is, and then we'll come back again. Yeah. Okay, and then there's another way of looking at this, that you send the two people to other therapists. Yes. So, so having then, individual therapy, but not with you. But not with you. You keep yeah. yourself out of the picture completely. Yeah. And you use two other therapists, one for one person and one for the other person. And then you come back, say, in four weeks and see what you've gleaned. Yes. Yeah. Because they are going to have individual things that maybe they want to talk about. So that would make sense. Yeah. Well, that's one way of looking for it. I mean, I'd partic I I moved away from that. So, in other words, in my later days doing couples, I didn't have that model that I, it, for me, it, I wanted them to share whatever their sabotage is or whatever it's about just with me. Yeah. So, it, it's, it's it's they are different models. Yeah, but I think they're different trainings, and I think that there are advantages and disadvantages of both. And one of the advantages of having yourself with the couple uh, and not separating them out, if you like, is that you would see you would see them from the beginning in terms of interlocking scripts and how things are played out together. Once you start hiving them out, in a way, the field gets larger. And then um, more challenging, you know, and it's much, and I think it's much better in the end to see the system from the beginning. Yeah. 
Well, as a therapist will say, well, some people you know, need to talk, like you've just said, in fact, talk individually or they feel the other person talks over them all the time. So there's no space, so they need some space and X, X. I think there's traps about that, by the way. And one of the, when I first, first started seeing couples, I remember doing it the way we're talking now. And I remember a classic mistake and that was that I didn't get a contract for shared confidentiality. Yeah. Because, and so I ended up in a situation with the, you know, it was the woman in this case saying she'd had an affair and I, please don't tell Bill, mm. but I'm going to see Bill in four weeks time. So I, I ended up trapped. So I learned very quickly that if you are going to do it that way, you need to have shared confidentiality. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so there's things you need to learn in training, I think, to do in these particular styles or modalities. Yeah. Yeah. Because, it, you know, even I can remember I, I move my chair when I'm seeing couples. So I am literally in the middle. I don't want to be even something as simple as that can be you know I don't know misconstrued in a session so whereas I always have my chair in a particular place which is kind of nearer to one person I literally move my chair so I'm directly in the middle of both of them and it's oh, so you don't have them sitting together opposite you well they sit together opposite me but whereas my chair is usually to one side I move it so I'm kind of directly facing oh both central as opposed to over to one side and and things like that i think there's so much to learn from a bit of training before you do couples yeah. and one of them is i what i will call the mediating or parent transference in other words ostensibly the child in both partners wants to look to the parent to say that their sense of reality is the right one yeah and so I think the person who's the therapist needs some training about some of these processes. Yeah. yeah. Like you said. Yeah. And I can see why, you know, touching back on what you were saying about, you know, whether you call it homework or work outside the therapy room and things. That, that that is really beneficial, you know, for them to then bring it back and use that as, you know, part of a discussion on how it felt and, you know, did it work? Did you, do you feel any better? Were the benefits to it as it, did you argue? Because a lot of it is, is down to communication. And, you know, being in a partnership is quite difficult because we've all got our own upbringing, our own reality, the way that we see the world. And then you get married and it's like, wow, I didn't think it was going to be like this. Or you live together. Well, one of the questions I would nearly always ask, um, I nearly, nearly, nearly always ask this question to anybody coming to me for couples therapy, um, was if you, you know, if your parents are alive and say their parents or significant other people are alive, I used to say, well, if they were in the same room now, would you, would they actually get on with each other? Yeah. Interesting question. <laughs> yeah. Because usually, usually people have different um, instructions, commands, injunctions from, from their parents in their heads, which may disagree completely with their partner's parenting in their heads. Yeah. In other words, in TA, you would call it interlocking scripts. So you would, so it's a really important thing to think about the internalized parenting messages, injunctions, decisions that each of the partners have in their head. That's one thing. And again, if you're a TA therapist, another thing you would look for would be the um, transaction analysis style between the two people. In other words, which person took up the parent position more and which person took up the child position more. Yeah. So you would think about it transactionally like that as well. 
And I think there's quite a lot of educative therapy in couples work as well, where, as I said, you might teach them things like that. You know, what happens to the adult relationship then if that's the major transactional style? And how did that major transactional style um, happen in the first place? And all, all sorts of things like that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I, the educational, you know, educational things, that's definitely one of the, my flip chart was always out in the room when I was doing <coughs> therapy. Yeah. Mm. And I think one of the things that, that comes up a lot for me um, when I'm seeing couples is kind of the psychological process and the psychological development, you know, it, it, individuation and separation and the honeymoon period and all those sort of things, dependent on the length of the relationship and psychologically whereabouts they are in it, they can be in two totally different places to each other. You know, one's quite comfortable and settled in the relationship and okay to go out and be with their friends and come back whereas the other one doesn't want to be left because of fear of abandonment so you know I saw that an awful lot with with couples yes lots of things happen in couples but well I think it, I'm going to repeat myself again I think more than groups I think to have some specialist training on how to work with couples is important yeah it's very different from individual therapy yes yeah and it, the... it is quite intimate you you know it, it's it, there's a lot of intimate things can be discussed in in couple therapy as well yeah i think i think it's a yeah and in individual therapy but you know it's a bit like if you asked me over the last 35 years which medium I enjoyed most, individual therapy, group therapy, couples therapy. My, my favourites uh, and my passion were more in group therapy and individual therapy, even though I thought I was a good couples therapist, I don't think I was as passionate in that area as I was in the other two areas. Hence, I didn't do as much couples work as many of my peers did. Yeah. Um, so I do think that therapists have their own, you know, investments in certain areas. And some people might be, you know, more passionate say, in running groups than working with couples. My tip for all this is I think that if you haven't got a particular passion in one area and though you might be good at it and though you might have learned how to do it and all these things um i would go with your your passion rather than say a sense of duty or money i completely agree 100 percent. yeah mm. yeah some people go to couples there because they, they i've heard people say well because there's more money there for example we can charge more money xxxx I think those sorts of things are the wrong reasons. I think go where you're passionate. I was far, I think, passionate about individual and group therapy particularly, and long, and in fact, psychotherapy, what I call marathons, which might go on for a week, than I was with couples work. Yeah. I don't, I'm not, I don't want to diminish the fact that I was not, did, you know, I did a lot of good work in couples therapy, but it wasn't my favorite style yeah and i think it's important for us to acknowledge as therapists you know that, that we do have a preference to one maybe than, than another and that's okay like you say rather than offering everything to everybody mm. i think my favorite style talking to you was running groups yeah you when when i was at the institute that was what you were known for was the groups as opposed to the individual the groups and supervision yeah groups is probably looking back at my career and I still work you know I still run some therapy groups I've got one coming up in three or four weeks and they're they're trainees that get hold of me and say you know would you run a group and things like that yeah. so and I still run these three-day marathons still and still so I haven't quite let go, go of the group of therapist in me good um, 
but I do think the, I do think, I think the therapists um, aren't always generalists. What I mean by that, that they can, they, they feel, you know, okay in every modality, group therapy, individual therapy, and, you know, how many generalists there are, I don't know, but I'm, I think I'm more of a specialist. Yeah. Already. Yeah, and I, I, I was going to say that I think it's okay to to make the decision to be a specialist in a particular area if that's where your heart is and you're passionate about it. It's well, it, uh, it is. Yeah, I yeah. have a very good friend of mine who actually I've known for a very long time, a very good therapist, and his passion is in couples therapy. So what has he done? He's gone off and started a couples whole couples training he's got a center that deals with not exclusively still does individual work but is I would say has a huge passion in training therapists to do couples work and does couples work himself and I have no doubt that that that's he he he's one of his big specialisms yeah from a passionate place yes yeah and I, I, I completely agree I think it's okay as therapists to to have specialist areas. It doesn't mean you're not competent in area, other areas. I'm just talking about passion, really. Yeah, yeah. And we are human beings at the end of the day. And we are passionate about certain things and it's, it's good to honour that in the therapy room. So what we're going to be looking at on the next one, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this one, is imposter syndrome within the therapy process. Oh, well, this will be one of my favourite podcasts. Oh, so it might be a long one, the next one, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know about that, but it's something I uh, I think about a lot. And it would be, I just think about it, and I haven't got the time now, but I, I'm looking forward to talking about that subject already. I'm looking forward to being a participant and listening to everything that you've got to say about it it really interests me that as well personally and professionally well, so as a, one thing as a tip to get people to come and listen to the one particularly i think that major treatment working with somebody with an imposter syndrome is first and foremost to get to know the imposter oh interesting so lots to talk about <laughs> Oh, you need to be on the next episode. We need to, yeah, you need to come back for the next episode all about imposter syndrome in the therapy process. Thanks so much, Bob. I'll see you on the next episode. Okay, great. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.